I say, watch where you're going, woman. I gotta drive that buggy. Besides, if you if you're not a part of the, uh, the calendar, uh, we have a mobile calendar now that you can put on your phone, your smart devices, watch whatever you have. And uh, if, you, if you need access to that, uh, we can share it with you. Get with Scott Reynolds; he will send you the link. Um, besides that, we'll, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so, so we're working our way through um, the book of Judges. We are in our scripture journals. We're on page 53. Or, um, and if you're following along in your Bible, we're all the way to uh, verse 1. So, <laughs> we're going to make some progress today, though. Not even kidding. Probably. Yeah. Scott and Mr. Wheat, yeah, missed anything. Yeah, I didn't even see it. We're going to for sure get through verse 1 and 2 today. How about that? That's pretty good. No, I'm just kidding. Um, no, very good. So, we talked about a lot of the setup of chapter 1 is, uh, is based in the text of Joshua. Um, there... You know, their their side by side, their relationship in uh, in the Bible is um, is completely connected. Um, especially chapter one. Chapter one is so connected to Joshua. Um, 
you know, in Joshua, we, we learn about, you know, they, the, they come into the land. You know, they enter the promised land and, um, and all the things that take place there. Um, they take back the region. They, they, they're, they're conquests city by city. And um, we discussed a little bit of that last, last week. Uh, chapters 13 through 19 of Joshua cover the conquest um, material. Um, they're conquering, they're claiming in the name of Yahweh. Uh, they form these cities of refuge. They, they have all these uh, different altars that they build um, that, uh, you know, that they're doing it right. They're trying to follow. You know, God says, if you do this the way I tell you to, then everything's going to work out. And the problem is they just never do. You know? <laughs> now, in Joshua, though, I, for me, I feel like we're led to believe that we do a lot more than we find out that we did in Judges. Um, it, it's a... Uh, it's not really uh, a different perspective. It's more just like a, um, here's your instructions, go do this. And then in Judges, we find out what happens. I think that's a pretty good, uh, pretty good way of looking at today's. Um, as they're taking the land back, um, one thing that we'll even talk about a little bit today, uh, but next week is more important, is um, in the eyes of the Israelites, the land is defiled. This is our promised land. This is the land of milk and honey. This is, um, you know, this is what God has set aside just for us, but it's corrupted. It is evil, just like these evil Canaanites, uh, the, the, the seven tribes that have taken over the land. And, um, and we've got to not only get them out of here, we've got to get all their stuff out of here. We have to wipe them out completely. If we leave even a little bit of them here, it's going to affect us. Um, so they build these altars. Uh, they build this one out in Galilee, which is which is a, a big argument. Um, and, and, and from this, they're trying to set up, they're trying to establish themselves in the land and just try to take over the land and, and you know, wipe out all other um, idols, all other gods. Um, and so they start arguing. Um, how, how do we do this? Different things. They, they follow Joshua and um, the arguing leads to Joshua confronting the tribes. He brings all the tribes together to Shechem, um, and he has this awesome speech. He reconnects re with God. They reunite the, the covenant, and um, he, uh, I, I, I like the whole, the whole, the whole speech is, the, who will you serve? You know, here we are, who will you serve? Um, my, my favorite part here, my favorite, uh, it's right at the end of Joshua, Joshua 24. So fear the Lord and serve him wholeheartedly. Put away forever the idols of your ancestors uh, that your ancestors worshipped when they lived beyond the Euphrates and in, and in Egypt. Serve the Lord alone. But if you refuse to serve the Lord, then choose today whom you will serve. Would you prefer the gods of your ancestors that your gods that your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates, or will it be the gods of the Amorites in whom the land now you, you now live? As for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. Uh, one of the most famous um, Bible verses um, that we always use. Um, but the people replied, we would never abandon the Lord and serve other gods. And that that's kind of sums up the end of Joshua. It ends on this high note, you know. Um, it ends on this, we have fully um, taken over the land and everything is great. We would never serve other gods. And it's just like you turn the page. Here we are in Judges 1, and we're already there, you know. Um, they're going to go back and forth. Joshua, um, you know, in his time, he warned them against it, warned them against it. If we get in there, we have to do this, we have to do this. And it was kind of led to believe that, that we did, you know, but then we, we find um, here at the very beginning that they did not. If you abandon God and serve other gods, he will turn against you and destroy you, even though he loves you. Then the people said to Joshua, we will serve the Lord our God and we will obey, obey him alone. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day at Shechem, committing them to follow the decrees and regulations of the Lord. Joshua recorded these things in the book of God's instructions. As a reminder of their agreement, he set a huge stone and he rolled it beneath this tree um, beside the tabernacle. Joshua said to all the people, this stone has heard everything the Lord said to us. It will be a witness uh, to testify against you. If you go back on your word to God. And Joshua sent all the people away to their homelands. All the leaders die. His, his sons pass away. They all, they all pass away. They're all buried in the promised land. And it completes um, the, the conquest. Or, or 
so we thought. Uh, we'll open with a quick prayer, and then we'll get into our word. Dear Lord, we just thank you so much for bringing us here this morning. We ask that you challenge and change us this morning. We ask that you help us block out all of our distractions and focus on your word as you reveal yourself to us this morning. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. All right. So, uh, like, like I mentioned last week, this is an excellent, uh, excellent opportunity to sit back and relax and uh, just kind of engage the text, you know, uh, Forget about your kids, although some of them are running down the hall unwatched. Um, you know, it's okay. Um, they'll get caught up with hopefully before they get outside. But um, we, uh, I, I just want to, uh, I just want to say this is this is this is some um, some difficult text, and, and we're gonna we're gonna just right off the bat we're talking about some difficult subjects. So uh, bear with me. If you got any questions, throw them out there. We'll see we'll see how we do it. But uh, we open up when you open up the book of Judges, you open up to the prologue. And um, we discussed that a little bit last week. But the first section here is really the report of Israel's performance. Um, and it's broken up into two parts, um, which I really like. And, and we start off with this military report. Um, but a couple, a couple of general observations on chapter one before I read it. Um, give us a little, give us a little uh, you know, context. Um, what, what we do right here off the bat is he kind of retells Joshua 13 through 19. That's a little bit of what he does. He, he kind of recasts it in his own, the author kind of talks about it in his own way to some degree. Um, he's very, he, the author's very familiar with Joshua, and he expects his readers to be as well. So when he's talking about these different things, he expects his readers to understand these things. We talked about, you know, like the, the parenthetical comments last week where he says, you know, these things are just like this up until this day, you know, and he's talking to people who are a part of this land. I think that's that's a good part to, to keep in mind. It's as if we live there, you know? Um, I, I, you know, um, yeah, we'll move on from that. But um, the the order of the reports is so important to keep up with, and we'll, we'll talk about this as we work through the Bible, uh, as we work through the book. But, you know, we've got our maps on our, on our, um, on our desks there, <laughs> on our desks, on our tables, and, uh, this, this order that he works through this is such a specific order geographically. Um, and we'll see that as, as he works his way through it. He starts off in, in the south with Judah. And he's going to work his way all the way around in a specific purposeful order, um, which we don't see without, you know, the, the assistance of, of our maps, you know, um, being not from uh, the tribes of Judah or uh you know, any, any of the other tribes, we're not familiar with the allotted land, you know, relationship. So, um, as we work through this, we're going we're gonna to know that he is purposefully starting here. He's going to then talk about these guys. He's going to give his military report in a specific order. Um, it's very deliberate. Uh, and, and although the reports are for individual tribes, the author's concern for Israel as a whole, and I think that's important to, to see. Does he have a, a very focused um, section on Judah here at the beginning? He does, um, and that's why that's why many people would say that the author's, uh, you know, in, from the tribe of Judah. But um, twenty of the thirty-six verses concern Judah. There's there's all kinds of stuff in here that we're going to. I'll just get into all this in a second. But if, if there's another thing that I love about chapter one, is that as he goes through this military report, there is this progressive or degressive. Just, it's just worse and worse and worse. Very much following the, you know, the, the pattern of the entire book. Here we are with this judge and this judge, and now we're worse, and now we're worse, and can't even believe it, but we're even worse. And, and that's, that's, that's chapter one as well. Um, it's written in the exact same style. Um, so chapter one, I'm going to read uh, the first 11 verses. I was planning on reading through the whole thing, but we're never going to get through the whole thing um, today. Um, but we'll read through the first 11 verses together, and then we'll, uh, we'll discuss it. After the death of Joshua, the Israelites asked the Lord, What tribe should go first to attack the Canaanites? The Lord answered, Judah, for I have given them victory over the land. The men of Judah said to their relatives from the tribe of Simeon, Join with us to fight against the Canaanites living in the territory allotted to us. Then we will help you conquer your territory. So the men of Simeon went with Judah. When the men of Judah attacked, the Lord gave them victory over the Canaanites and Perizzites. 
and they killed 10,000 enemy warriors at the town of Bezek. While at Bezek, they encountered King Adonai Bezek and fought against him, and the Canaanites and Perizzites were defeated. Adonai Bezek escaped, but the Israelites soon captured him and cut off his thumbs and big toes. Adonai Bezek said, I once had 70 kings with their thumbs and big toes cut off, eating scraps from under my table. Now God has paid me back for what I did to them. They took him to Jerusalem, and he died there. The men of Judah attacked Jerusalem and captured it, killing all its people and setting the city on fire. Then they went down to fight the Canaanites living in the hill country, the Negev, and the western foothills. Judah marched against the Canaanites in Hebron, formerly called Kiriath Arba, defeating the forces of Shesha, Ahaman, and Talmai. From there, they went to fight against the people living in the town of Debir, formerly called Kiriath Sefer. Sefer. We're going to go with Sefer. Uh, there's so much going on here. There's so many different names and places named where you're just like, don't know, don't know, don't know. It's very easy to get lost in this. Um, that's why we're just going to break it down to the smallest detail until we just feel like we know old Adonai. What is that? You know? um, but so going back to the first two verses, uh, those those are the preamble to the report. They would have been, um, you know, they're, they're the, our main focus at the beginning. Um, and remember, this mili this report is of military failure. It, it, it is, it is um, you know, we'll, we'll get into that. The book opens with two reports. The second report's right after this one. The first ends at 2-5, and the second report starts at 2-6. Um, you've got the military failure report, and then you've got the religious failure report. And they, and they cover the same thing, but man, they're so different. Um, they're very interesting. Um, side by side, and, and because of that, many, many uh, historians will call this a, a double introduction. It introduces itself, and then when we get to 2.6, it does the exact same thing again, um, but with a much different intent, much different tone. It's, um, it's, uh, it's very obvious, but we'll, we'll see when we get to it. So it opens up, after the death of Joshua, the Israelites asked the Lord, which tribe should go first to attack the Canaanites? The Lord answered Judah, for I have given them victory over the land. And like we talked about last week, this is our first time marker after the death of Joshua. Um, and, and we won't really understand why that's so important until we get to that second report uh, in chapter 2. But to the author, this is, this is the time marker of the beginning of the time of the judges. Like we talked about when you go to Ruth 1, that this is, a, this is an important time marker in the history of the Jewish people. Uh, in the history of the Israelites. Um, if you're looking for years, uh, which I didn't provide last week, I'll give you some years. The death of Joshua, is, the most conservative number, is 1427 B.C. Um, 1427 B.C. And by almost everybody who says the same, that, that number, Judges 1 is 1425. So two years later, we're already in this huge mess. Uh, the guy's only been gone two years, and we're already doing terrible. But um, we're in the early Iron Age, which we're going to get into more. There's so many things going on in the world at this time uh, that will affect uh, not, not just the Israelites themselves, but those surrounding tribes. Uh, but 1425 is a good, is a good uh, year. The, the thing to know, which the author makes obvious, is Joshua's dead. He's out of the picture. He has nothing to do with these events. We're leaderless. You know, that's, that's a good way of looking at it. Um, we have the preamble. In the preamble, we see there are signs of hope. Um, for me, it starts off so, here we are with God. You know, like we're, we're walking and talking with God. We're still following just like we did in Joshua. Um, they, they consult God as a group. You know, he's like, he's, he's with them. Um, they ask, they, uh, they're looking for his guidance. Um, they, they, have this, they have this right approach for me. They ask the right question. Who do you want us to send first, you know? Um, and, and they're using God as their commander-in-chief. They're using God as their sole leader in verses 1 and 2. <laughs> um, he, he's continuing that same relationship that he has with them in Joshua uh, with his agenda, um, not their own. I think that's pretty good. Who should go up first? Uh, 
he says Judah, and up to this point in the Old Testament, I, I like, there's so many hints at, jo, at Judah being, you know, the most important tribe, let's just call it. Um, but it, it's really here where everything comes out in the open. Up until this point, it's just kind of in the shadows and different things. Um, in, in, in Genesis 49, our, one of our big introdu introductions to Judah himself is, um, Judah, your brothers will praise you. You will grasp your enemies by the neck. All your relatives will bow before you. Judah, my son, is a young lion that has finished eating its prey. Like a lion, he crouches and lies down. Um, who dares to rouse him? Um, there, there is this. He is, he is powerful. He is all these things. And by the time they come out of the wilderness, the Israelites take over the promised land, it's, it's the largest tribe. Um, so they are um, more active than some of the other tribes. Nice way of saying, it. and they they uh, they multiply. You know, they they um, they allotted the largest amount of land uh, because of that, and uh, they're very strong. I, I think that's a good way to say it. And, and of course, we know that after this time, that's where David comes from. That's where the Messiah comes from. Uh, Judah lasts the longest. Um, so many things um, that we can say about the tribe of Judah, but this is really their their whole coming out thing right here, where they're set up, they set themselves apart to be the special group. Um, so God answers the question and he promises victory. Uh, and Yahweh said, Judah shall go up. Behold, I have given the land into his hand. And it fulfills um, Psalm 34, 17. The Lord hears his people when they call to him for help. He rescues them from all their troubles. And so this is this is uh, what's, what's kind of happened. Back and tracking into, uh, back tracking, back tracking into Joshua again. Um, their agenda is a national agenda. It's for everybody. They're, they're all together. Um, Joshua leads the Israelites against the Canaanites as one group. Uh, the book ends with Joshua dismissing the tribes, the, their troops, the, you know, their own lands, settle there. And then here we have, uh, we're, we're at these allotted lands, and hey, there's still more people here, you know? Uh, we're encountering all these different tribes who are not interested in just moving out. Um, but so, so following that, um, the author's focus is the tribe of Judah. Their failures and their successes is really what, what verses 3 through 20 is. Um, the first thing is they, they have this, they have this um, alliance that's formed between Judah and Simeon. In verse 3, and Judah said unto his, his brother, uh, Simeon, his brother, come up with me into my lot and uh, we'll fight against the Canaanites. And then I'll come help you. Uh, so Simeon went up with him. And, and I really like that. Um, there's, there's, a, there's a good translation note here. You know, as, as we're working the way through the, through the text, keep in mind that this translation is really a thought for thought. You know, and that's, that's really the goal of the NLT. We really see it right here as it compared to other translations because the NLT uses the men of Judah. Um, you know, it, it, he says this to the, the men of Simeon. You know, which is obvious. You know, we know this is not Judah and Simeon speaking to each other, but that is the literal text. So, when you talk about the ESV or the CSB or the KJV, that's the way it reads. Judah says to his brother Simeon. You know, all throughout this whole text, it is this very literal. These two people are speaking to each other, which can be somewhat confusing. You know, that's very, it, it that's is. Hard. It's very. It's very similar to what, when uh, we say Jacob and Esau. Uh -huh. Um, they're not talking, Jake and Esau have been dead for 3,000 years, mm -hmm. we're still talking about it, but like that's, it's the same type of language, you know. Um, the NLT, focusing on thought for thought, goes ahead and says, it's the men of these, it's, it's the tribes of, of Judah and the tribes of Simeon speaking to each other. Um, so, uh, that's, that's a good thing to keep in mind, I like that. Um, it's the tribe or descendants of Judah, same to the tribe or descendants of Simeon. Uh, Judah and Simeon themselves died about 1689. So this is 264 years uh, after their death. Uh, so we, we clearly know, um, just in reading right now, let's see, um, that this is, this is the tribe, this is the descendants, the ancestor, the, the descendants. Um, but of course, there's this natural brotherhood between the two of them. You know, they are, they're, they're full-blooded brothers, you know, they're Leah being their um, maternal ancestor. Yeah, that's good. Um, but so Judah, one of the largest, Simeon, one of the smallest, they have so many relationships. 
but one that we're going to spotlight today is on our geographical maps. Um, when we look down at the bottom left and we see Simeon, we see that it's completely surrounded by Judah, all the way around it, which is a very unique relationship already. Um, it's always in the best interest of Simeon to help Judah, you know, always. Um, because if they can't get to you, I mean, they're not going to get to us if they, they can't get to you, you know. Um, so I think that's one of the keys to understanding the relationship. It is a kind of a forced relationship. I don't know if it's forced, but it, it, is, a, uh, it is a mutual agreement. You know, a mutual, you know, they, they both benefit out of it. Um, but another thing to keep in mind, as we work our way through Judges, as we get into Kings and, and the monarchy divides, Simeon is absorbed by Judah. Um, which is, which is very, you know, and it's a little sad, but, you know, that, that's what happens. They'll lose their identity in, in, in Judah, Judah Heights. Judah Heights. Um, uh, those of Judah. Anyway, their settlement is uh, completely within Judah. And so, of course, they agree to it. And then um, it, he starts going into the successes, that's what we'll call them, of Judah. Uh, the authors laid out this military alliance between Judah and Simeon. And then in verse 4, we start with what would be called the Upland Campaign. Um, they went up, is our, is our identifier. Um, unfortunately, here again in the NLT, we don't use that language of the literal, they went up. But that is, that is the text here. If you have an ESV or KJV or whatever you're looking up. Um, in verse 4, it starts off, Then Judah went up, and the Lord gave the Canaanites and the Perizzites into their hand. And they, defect, and they defeated 10,000 of them. At Bezek. Um, and then and then we go into this victory at Bezek, which is a very uh, strange um, interaction. But four starts with when the men of Judah attacked. And so we can assume there that it's the allied forces of Judah and Simeon. Again, losing their distinction, they're just like included in there um, because they're so much smaller. So they attack. The target is the Canaanites and the Perizzites. Uh, the results of victory. Uh, and of course, we'll learn that as we go through the book, when um, it says, you know, these different groups, so, sometimes it means different things. Uh, the Canaanites are all the tribes that are in the land. If you want to call that whole map anything, you can call it Canaan. Um, the entire map is Canaan at this point. Uh, now, the Israelites are calling it Israel, but nobody else is agreeing with that. Everybody who lives there does not agree to those terms. Very similar to 2024. Uh, very similar. Um, but the Canaanites are all the tribes that are in the land other than the Israelites. Um, now the Perizzites themselves is a much more specific group. They're south of Jerusalem. You see Jerusalem on the, on the line there. Um, you'll see it. It's kind of in the middle. Um, but it's, it's where Benjamin touches Judah. Um, but it's south of there. It's, it's out in the open country, um, which is kind of what their name means. It's not an ethnicity which is something that we often do, we will look at the Perizzites and we'll say, well, that's a people group. It's more, it's more of a city-state, like we talked about last week, where it is people who join up um, because they live in this area. Can you say that one more time? The yes. entire land is, is Can Canaan, Canaan mm -hmm. but you said something else, like, but the, that's what they're calling it. Yes, oh, so, so people, who, people who live right. there... I have no idea what I just said. Okay. People, I'm just saying, uh, people okay. who live there were the Canaanites. Okay. Um, okay. And so all the tribes, yeah. even the Perizzites, are Canaanites. Okay. So, that, so it is a little confusing. Uh -huh. um, but they're all Canaanites. The people who live in Canaan are Canaanites. Um, the Israelites call it Israel. Thank you. But yes. the Israelites call it Israel. The Israelites, they do not call it. This yeah, is our promised land. Yeah, yeah. yeah, this is, okay. you know, this okay. is Genesis uh, 14. Abraham, this is his land, you know? Okay. Um, and so, yeah, and so that they have a much different perspective on this land. Um, so they live in the area, um, the Perizzites, but, but they're known as open country. That's kind of what that term means. And many people like to look at that as like an unwalled, unfortified city. Um, much more of like a farming community than uh, a militaristic city. Um, they don't have any walls. It's, it's definitely... Uh, the way to look at that, but they're the most obscure. They're the, they're the least known of all the different um, of the different nations of Canaanites. They're the Perizzites, but um, keep in mind they are Canaanites themselves. I know that's a little confusing, but 
Uh, when you see Canaanites and Perizzites together, which is, uh, happens all throughout the Old Testament, it means the Perizzites and this unnamed group of Canaanites. So there were people helping them that we don't know of, but they lived there. So it's, it's, it's a general term, but it's less specific than I, we know those people. They're the Jebusites, you know, that type of thing. Um, Genesis 13 is actually the first time the Perizzites are mentioned. So disputes broke out between the herdsmen of Abram and Lot. At that time, Canaanites and Perizzites were also living in the land. So they've been living there for 500 years. These aren't just newcomers that as soon as they were, you know, the exile goes down to, you know, they were there when Abraham was there. Um, they lived there for 500 years. Uh, and they lived there for 1,000 years after this. Uh, in Ezra 9, it, it calls out the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, all these people still live there. So they lived there for like 1,500 years. It's provable just, just through the biblical text, not to mention you know, archaeology and extra-biblical um, you know, things. Um, so to give that in today's perspective, they would, they would have been around as long as France was. Mm -hmm. so, so like they're a known, a known group. You know what I mean? They, are, they have been around for it. Like we, you know, we think of France, oh, they've been around for it. Well, they've been around since about six, you know, 600. But it, it's a long time, you know? So they're not just this group of unknown people. They are dug in. You know, I like that. Um, the parasites, they last a long time. Um, and all this is in the south. And the result of the victory of Bezek says there's 10,000 men that are killed. Uh, our, our text says men. Uh, a couple other texts will say enemy warriors. Uh, or, or the NLT says in, in, enemy warriors, yes. Um, the NLT stressing there are none of those killed outside of those partaking in the war. I think, I think that's a good way to look at it. Many times when we read um, uh, yeah, the, the new KJV, uh, the NIV, you can get lost in this. There's this uh, group of, um, um, it's, it's, it's like a school bus of kids running across. Oh, they're wiped out too. And all these things are going on. You know, like, it, this is much more, these people died in the battle. These are the uh, men, not the wives. And that's right. These are the, the engagers family. in battle. Yes, they all had weapons in their hand when they died. Um, that's a lot. Ten thousand. Ten thousand. Now, that's like how many I don't want to complicate anything or slow us down, but I will say, oh, I took my watch off and I look for it. Anyway, it doesn't even work, which is even funny. But um, oh yeah, uh, this is going to be. You know, I, I do feel like many times when we engage the Bible, I, I think that it's very good for us to be uncomfortable. I think that's that's okay. And um, sometimes you can be challenged um, when, when engaging the text. And here's a little, this is one of the most liberal things I'll probably say all morning. But um, do I think there was a death toll counter that went out to the battlefield after it was over and he said 9,999, 10,000, there's 10,000, everybody, and then they write it down. I do not think that. Now am I saying that this is a generalized number, meaning you couldn't even see the end of it. I'm not technically going that far, but I want to say that the point of that is there were so many people killed, you wouldn't even believe it. You know, wow. Just to sum it up in a very paraphrased uh, way. Um, do you have any trouble with that? Talk with me after class. Anyway. Yeah, I, all of them. It could have been two. It, does, it, doesn't, it doesn't say all of them. It yeah, I said it doesn't. It, it doesn't, doesn't say they all don't of them. Kill all of them. Right, right. But it could have been two that they knew how many men they had, and so then they knew. Mm -hmm. They had 20 left over. Yeah, yeah, 2, exactly. Okay, they got 2,000. Because of, you know. Uh, it, it's, it's not like they're going and counting, but they knew how many men they had, so mm -hmm. then they knew who, yeah. The author's point is to give a number that is overwhelming. Right. That, that's a good way of looking at that. Um, his intent. Is but I think what they're, by doing that, by giving you 10,000, you're trying to say, like, they could not done, have done that without God. That's good. That's yeah, good. That's yeah, good. No, yeah. It is a victory. It's, oh, it's, yeah, yeah. That, they went that's good. Mm -hmm. it, it's saying, it's like when we, we go in talking about what's his name. And he has to weed out, weed out, weed out, weed out. You know, and he's got 300 men and he kills all these guys. It's Gideon. 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 Yes. Gideon. It, it's to fact to show you that God had, yes. had to be in this in order for them 
to be able to kill that man. That's it. One of the main things is, is Yahweh is giving the that, that's correct. That's exactly yeah. right. Um, no, that's that's very good. Mm -hmm. um, Anyway, um, no, you're good, you're good. Um, moving on. So then in verse 5, they found um, Adonai Bezek in Bezek, and they fought against him, and they struck down the Canaanites and the Perizzites. But Adonai Bezek fled, and they pursued him and seized him and cut off his thumbs and big toes. Oh. Gotcha. And Adonai Bezek said, Seventy kings with their thumbs and their big toes cut off used to, used to gather up scraps under my, under my table as I have done. So God has repaid me. So they brought him to Jerusalem and he died there. So there's this very strange anecdote here where we have this just very uh, strange little story. Um, just a couple sentences here about Adonai Bezek. Um, but it gives us just this little window into his life for me, you know. Um, because, man, 70 kings. Anyway, we'll get to that in a second. But his name um, is more of a title. It's the first thing. That is not his name. Uh, his name is not Adonai Bezek, um, which means Lord of Bezek. He is the Lord of Bezek as a title. It is a good way to look at that. Um, it's not his literal name. He's the Lord of Bezek. Could he be the mayor? Could he be the governor? Um, could he consider himself a king, a malek, like those 70 kings that he killed? Possibly. Could he then be saying that by killing these 70 kings, he actually just beat other encampments or towns or groups? Yes, that's, that's a much better way of looking at it, rather than other nations. He's definitely the leader of this city, though. Um, and how's he treated? Well, they mutilate him. <laughs> that's the strangest start to a, right here we are in chapter 5, I mean, verse 5, in chapter 1, and then we got this crazy mutilation going on. Um, and there's, there's a couple different reasons, you know, um, possibilities. Uh, there's, there's a few I like. But the cruel treatment by the Israelites could be because this is a common practice. This is a common practice of ancient captives to cut off their thumbs and uh, big toes. Um, or turning the tables on a leader who is known for that. You've been doing this to all these people in this land for all this time. Now we're going to do that to you, you know. Uh, there's a couple. There's a couple different ways to look at it. Uh, you can look at it how you want, but keeping with the theme of the book, the Israelites are treating their captives how the non-Israelites treat their captives. So that's the information to keep up with. There, we didn't really treat this in the way that God told us to. We acted as if everybody else around us, and then we, we see what they're doing, and then we follow that. That's that's really the point here. Um, these ethical choices are being influenced by the surrounding tribes. That's, that's the uh, digression that we will see as we continue. Uh, this is a Mesopotamian practice, um, and the purpose of it is to prevent that man from ever being able to enter battle again. Um, that that would have been that would have been the thought behind it. Because for me, I'm just like, what's the point of that? You know, like, well, I mean, you're still giving him like direct his other finger, like just maybe like from the elbows or so. I don't know. Um, I wasn't in charge of but, um, And how does he respond to his own mutilation? He acknowledges that God is paying him back for the way he treats, treated his victims. Um, Why are people so mean? That just seems so cruel and awful. I mean, it's the way this, is a, this is a cruel book. The whole thing's cruel. Um, it, it, is not, it is not the world we live in. Um, I don't know. Well, There's some present day... You know what I mean. There is some conflict in present day, but it is much different on the scale. You know, um, much different scale. You know, most of us can't uh, relate to the idea. I'm talking about like the gods, the hostages, and horrific things going on. Yeah, yeah. I think no, that's true. Way. That's true. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. there, there is definitely some bad things, things going on. Okay. And then he says seventy kings. Um, this is not seventy slaves. These are not seventy uh, just warriors. These are definite leaders. These are definitely people who he might have been able to even call out some of their names, you know. Uh, he mutilates 70 kings. So he's infamous for this behavior, this activity. Um, he brutalized and mutila mutilated many leaders of surrounding towns and encampments. And then he says he had them eating scraps from under his table. And, of course, we all know that idiom means, you know, he treated them like dogs. Uh, that's, that's what that means there. I had their best. 
eating scraps from my table. Um, that's that's a very famous, you know, carried all the way through you know medieval times um, type of uh, idiom there. But why is it important? Um, everyone, and this is this is so foreign to us, but everyone in the ancient world interprets everything uh, theologically. I, I think that's a good way to look at it. At this time, although they may have had multiple gods, every event and result has to do with God in, in one way or another. I, I think that's a, that's a good way of looking at it. Um, he says, now God has paid me back for what I did. Um, Seventy kings with their thumbs and their big toes cut off used to gather up scraps under my table as I've done, so God has repaid me. So they brought him to Jerusalem and died there. Only modern Westerners have been able to push God out of their minds. All ancient Near Easterners all view history uh, theologically. Uh, there is a God involved in this battle. There is God involved here, and this was the result. That, that is uh, their mindset. Uh, there is this huge irony here that a Canaanite king is the one who announces that human beings will account to God for their actions. So there is, there is some humor in there. It's very lost on us with all these uh, toes and fingers being cut off. Um, but there is, there is, a, there is a, a certain level of irony to him admitting that um, as, his, as his last words. Um, and there, there is this hint, uh, of, like I said, of Israel's own canonization. Uh, they immediately adopt their ethics. They, they treat him the way he treats others, uh, which is, that's, that's one of the most underlying things there. It's strange that in the same verse, uh, they tell us that he was brought to Jerusalem and he dies there. I, I, that's a very strange ending to somebody you're going to go ahead and tell this specific line about, and maybe, maybe his, uh, his death was unknown. You know, they just found him dead, or maybe he bled to death. You know, I, you know how did he die? Um, Bleeding to death from mutilation at that time, or infection, or those type of things, would have been very common, because um, he obviously wouldn't have been treated. You know, he was obviously, you know, um, a prisoner of war. Um, but um, the the problem here to see is that God, who is backing the Judahites, they end up mutilating their victims. That's 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 one thing to see here. This is not God's will. God didn't say. Go attack that city. And if you got anybody left over, cut their toes and uh, big thumbs off. Yeah, I do. <laughs> um, it, it's, very, it's very funny. Well, it's not funny, but it, it's, um, we will notice as we, as we work our way through, almost whenever he gives instructions, almost whenever he gives instructions, we, they never follow him through. Almost never. Um, almost never. Um, so, but, but we are seeing here that even Judah, even the strong line of Judah is flawed. Uh, I think that's a good thing to keep in mind. And then uh, in verse four, you know, we, we talk, uh, we we get to Jerusalem. Is uh, is so much, so much happens in verse eight there. Um, I'll just go to that. The author spends one verse to say the men of Judah attacked Jerusalem and captured it, killing all its people and setting the city on fire. Now, there's a, there's a lot going on here. Uh, so Adonai Bezek, he's taken there. And he dies, and the, and the, the, Ju, the Judah, the uh, army of Judah, attacks the city and captures it. Um, so the first thing I'll say is just a little bit about Jerusalem. Is you know we are very familiar with Jerusalem. Uh, we understand its history. We understand the importance of it, not just in the Old Testament uh, world, but in uh, you know the time of Jesus and you know the, the, the Roman world. Um, it's it's always uh, an important city, um, you know, right on the, the trade routes, the King's Highway. Um, but this is pre-David Jerusalem. This is before all that. There's no temple. There's no, as, as we talked about on our maps, there's nothing indicating Jerusalem as any more important on that map than Shechem, than any other city we have on there. Um, it's a huge vantage point, though. Um, as, as the Bible goes on and David sees it as this military, you know, um, it, it's an excellent military city as well. Um, it, it's not at this time. It, it is this big plateau. It's kind of like there's these two mountains, and at the top they plateau across. That's that's kind of a good way to think of Jerusalem. It's very long. Um, it's similar to Lookout Mountain 
where Lookout Mountain at the end is, is long and then it comes down for a little way and then it's back up and, and but it's all it's just plateaued at the top. Excellent for building a city. Um, Lookout Mountain is the only thing I can think of because you have such a vantage point from up there. You can see so far. You can see Seven State. Um, but it's this it's this double top mountain. Um, on the west you have uh, Mount Zion. On the east you have Mount Moriah. Super famous. Um, all kinds of Old Testament things happening on there. There's these deep valleys. There's the Gihon Springs. There's all these waterways that, that affect it um, all the way around. It's very difficult um, to, to, to put under siege, um, as the entire Old Testament shows us. It's easily defensible um, against invaders. Um, the way the attackers always take Jerusalem, though, is they use the waterways. They use the, the there's these tunnels underneath the city um, that they use to their advantage. Um, there's, uh, when King Hezekiah, when he's under siege, he builds, he builds like these tunnel systems all the way through there. They're like, they're like this wide. Um, they're very tall, but they're, they're like two foot wide. And you, and you can go through there, there's water going through the whole time. And, um, there's still yeah. those tunnels. There's still, <coughs> yes. I've seen on TV. Yes, no. If you wear nice shoes in there, you're going to get your shoes messed up. Just throw that out there. Um, but, um, no, they're, they're, they're still there. Um, but King David uses them. Uh, Hezekiah, they're used against him. Um, archaeologists uh, found, you know, so many different pieces of pottery uh, from Jerusalem, but the, some of the earliest are from 1900 BC, so that'd be 500 years before this. Um, in those days, there's this, this famous uh, piece of pottery where, if you want to curse a city, if you want to do something bad against it, you write their name on it and you break it. It's kind of like a voodoo doll type of a thing for me, you know. Um, uh, <laughs> But they, uh, they, they found one of those, and, it had, and you put your enemy's name on it, and you're like, ah, I'll tell you what. But so, um, they, and there's many other artifacts. We won't go into any of that. But, um, but in Jerusalem, we see that it's attacked. And there's this law, uh, the law of Harem, which is set up right off the bat. God sets this up himself in Deuteronomy 7. I'm going to read it. It's about five uh, verses here. But it's very important to understand the way that, that is intended to, um, to take over a city. When the Lord your God brings you to the land you're about to enter and occupy, he will clear away many nations ahead of you. And he goes through all the different groups, the parasites, everybody. Um, these seven nations are greater and more numerous than you. When the Lord your God hands these nations over to you and you conquer them, you must completely destroy them. Make no treaties with them and show them no mercy. You must not intermarry with them. Do not let your daughters or your sons marry their sons or daughters. For they will lead your children away from me to worship other gods. Then the anger of the Lord will burn against you. He will quickly destroy you. This is what you must do. You must break down their pagan altars and shatter their sacred pillars. Cut down their Asherah poles and burn their idols. For you are a holy people who belong to the Lord your God. Of all the people on earth, the Lord your God has chosen you to be a special treasure. So Moses in that, he, he's calling for the total destruction of the city and a total slaughter of the population in the most literal way you can read it. It's a, it's a more uh, controversial line to throw there at the end. But to have these texts that call for the annihilation of a, a, a group of people, um, and then, for example, if you were to fast forward and you read chapter, uh, verse 21, the tribe of Benjamin, however, this is in Judges 1, 21, the tribe of Benjamin, however, failed to drive out the Jebusites who were living in Jerusalem. So just uh, 15 verses from now, the Jebusites have already taken over Jerusalem, and the Benjamites can't get them out. Um, so it, it, it's a, I don't want to say they didn't, they didn't kill everyone there, but they didn't kill everyone there. You know what I'm saying? Every, every single time uh, we find that, um, well, we're going to have to go take these lands back, uh, we're gonna, and they, went, they killed them all. And then chapters later, you will find that as these next people came, those people are still there. So um, just a little, uh, trying to complicate things a little bit for you. But Jerusalem is being controlled um, by the parasites at this point. They come in, they're attacked. We win. Uh, Judah and Simeon wins. Um, but did they follow the law of Karim? That's a good question. Once David's king, David attacks Jerusalem, uh, and he takes back Jerusalem himself. 
So even in saying that, during the time of the judges, when they lose it again, you know, so there's just so much to be said about that. We're, we're not going to uh, focus on that. I, I want to end with one part. Um, is is uh, verse 9. Verse 9, uh, I want to try to get to 11, but I'm not going to. But starts the lowland campaign. Uh, so we had the up, up, upland campaign, and then we had the lowland campaign, where the author starts his military report of, uh, of Israel's performance after um, Adonai Bezek. He moves to Jerusalem, he, he, uh, which becomes the most important city. And he says, they went down to fight the Canaanites, living in the hill country, the Negev, and the western foothills. And they moved down to the hill country, um, whereas they went up to Bezek, they now have to go down to the Negev, this arid desert. Um, again, it, it's looked at as open, but it's not, um, it's not as it's not as open and farm like as the parasites were. So that's where we'll, that's where we'll end. Uh, I already said it's five till. Uh, my goal is to end at ten till, but oh well. I just kept going with so many uh, fingers and toes being cut off. Does anybody? Uh, we'll get we'll get to the conquest of, uh, of Hebron next week. That's good. That's good. You're right there. Um, anybody have any thoughts? Anybody? I, I do think that. Um, I feel like I don't know all these I don't know. The geography, and so it's very, very There's a lot. There's a lot of information. I agree. Um, I feel like that's right. That's right. I, I feel like the most, uh, the most not interesting, but the most, uh, the, the hardest part for us to grasp, I think, is all this violence. You know, we we don't understand uh, a violent world, um, seeing as how we. If we were to think of the most violent thing we've ever thought of in our life, it wouldn't compare to a day in Israel. You know, um, it's just it's just overwhelming to us. You know, um, the Viking show, right? Um, but like you, yet you know, Israel today is used to fighting. They've had to fight forever, so they. For them, they're used to fighting mm -hmm. all the time. Right. For, for us, we, we have a disconnect when it says things like, go in there and kill all the people who are in there. But we also have a disconnect trying to imagine being fearful of someone killing you while you sleep. We don't really have that. We can't connect with no. the idea of, well, we, we're in our house. We locked the door. You know, we got the alarm on. You know, we got a gun. We're safe, you know. Uh, the neighbors are, hey, we got a dog. This is, uh, this is, just turn it up, dog. Right. <laughs> this is like a whole other ball game. You and your family are in this small farm, and if if you can't protect yourself, then, then you are wiped out and your things are taken and your children are taken in slavery, and that's the world, you know. Uh, it's, it's a much harsher uh, reality that, that they're surrounded with rather than the air-conditioned, um, you know, comfortable uh, chairs that we have in here. You know, it's, it's a whole different world. Um, so, hopefully you can give them a little bit of, um, you know, uh, tolerance. I don't know what the right word is. But uh, they just, they just they, they're in a different world, you know. And, and it, uh, anybody got any, any other thoughts on it? I think a lot of times, uh, when I think about other Places and when I think all the time about being free and saved, uh, so to speak, I think about um, I, it's hard to put you wrap your mind around how God allows war and horrific things, and how, uh, of course, we you know it's not his plan, you know. But I think a lot of times, especially when I hear about things like right now, what's going on uh, over the the street and the hostages. You know what I mean? It kind of, it takes you back. I mean, that's just been going on. It's just a part, it has been so, we have been so blessed. It has been such a horrific part of certain people's lives and existence and we can't even, like you said, we just can't even and imagine. And it, and it makes me fear for, I don't know, our future, the way with so many changes and I don't know. I just feel like, well, we know that there's going to be a lot of things happening. I saw this very interesting, uh, here's a quick perspective on 2024 in America. Mm -hmm. I saw this uh, TikTok type of reel, I don't know what those things are called. Anyway, yeah, I saw right. this video this week, 
And it was this girl, and she was going to press charges against this man. Um, she was drowning um, in, a, in a public pool or something, and he, uh, she went unconscious. He comes and saves her, and she's pressing charges because you know he didn't ask permission. He didn't um, he didn't uh, follow the, the protocols in which she thought were uh, were needed. And so they're going to court over that. Wow. <laughs> oh my God! What? It's a good thing I'm not a judge. Yeah. If, if you want to talk about unrelatable, that's unrelatable. That's unrelatable. You know? Um, yeah. Anyway. All right, we're going to close in prayer. If anybody has anything that you'd like for us to pray for, share with us um, something coming up this week or anything, let me know. We would, uh, we'd love to pray for you. Yeah, just pray for Bailey to start the ther- uh, meeting of therapy on Thursday. Dear Lord, we just thank you so much for bringing us in here this morning, uh, helping us with this this, uh, this this challenging text this morning. We ask that you you use it to uh, to shape our minds around you. Help us to understand you better as we work our way through the text. Um, we ask that you continue to uh, bless our um, service this morning, uh, bring us to worship this morning, and it's in your name that we pray. Amen.